Hey, what's up, family? Pastor Ansel McMahon here. Hey, listen, we are so grateful that you're able to take advantage of this Bible resource from Emmaus Church. Every single week, our desire is to preach and teach the scriptures in such a way that is both edifying and encouraging. We want to exalt Jesus, and our desire is that these resources would serve as a supplement to your involvement in a local church wherever you are. It is absolutely critical, according to God's Word, that you be involved in a church, connecting in the church, being in relationships within that church, serving the body of Christ, giving generously, involved in a local church. And so we hope this blesses you. And if it does bless you, consider maybe giving to our ministry here at Emmaus Church. You can do that on our app. You can do that on our website. But until then, just know we're praying for you, and we truly do hope this blesses your life. I will not be anxious. In Jesus, you are near. The peace of God surrounding me is casting out all fear. The hand that holds the heavens is the mighty hand that saves. The voice that calms the stormy seas is calling me by name. I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross. I'm resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life. Cause I am yours forever And Jesus, you are mine Oh, Jesus, you are mine When I have When I have forgotten Fullness of your grace. Yes, I'll remember. Yes, I'll remember Calvary. Oh, where you took my place. Oh, I'm singing in the victory, the victory of the cross. I'm resting in the shadow of your redeeming love. I'm standing on the promise, the promise of new life, cause I am yours forever, Jesus you are mine, oh Jesus you are mine. to sing in all
church it's so good to be with you this morning and to be in God's house to sing his praises and uh, we're going to continue to do that um, this morning and and my hope today is that is that uh, wherever wherever you are today I want you to know this you can't do it is that an inspiring message or what (laughs) you can't do it let me show you where I'm coming from and why there's actually a lot of grace and a lot of good news in that truth this morning. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 8, says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hope you saw it. This is not your own doing. We couldn't do it. But God in his grace and his mercy, he sent Jesus in our place. He did what we could never do. He said all of us who would believe we could follow him, have life, have life abundantly, and walk in these good works that he has prepared before us. And we're going to sing about that that truth today. We're going to declare that It's yet not I, but through Christ in me that all these things are true. Let's continue to sing together. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I owe my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine i can sing all this mine yet not i but through christ in me the night is dark but I am not forsaken. Amen. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this, to this I hold, my shepherd will defend. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has 
and won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, but I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. Here's why. For Jesus bled and suffered for my part. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. Yeah. To this I owe my sin has been defeated. Jesus now. to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hope my hope is only Jesus Oh! Church, you may be seated. How we doing, family? I want to say congratulations, fall break weekend, and you're the ones who couldn't get out of town, like me. So here we are, we're blessed and highly favored, okay? And so we're just going to jump into the Bible, right? We're, we're going to, uh, we're, we're, it's called Bible therapy today, okay? We're going to dive into the scriptures and forget about our issues and focus on Jesus. Hey, I want to welcome you. Uh, if you are new here, my name is Anson. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, I want to say thanks for visiting. I want to let you know a few things. Uh, for those of you who may, maybe are here for the first time, 
couple of things you need to know. First of all, uh, we'd love to know who you are. We'd love to know that you visited. So uh, you can text our number that'll come up on the screen later. Uh, text us, let us know that you were here so we can follow up with you this week. You can also visit, and this is really important, visit the Welcome Center uh, that's gonna be outside and it's, it's sort of to your left. You'll see it right there in the Welcome Center. We got a free gift for you if you're new here. We'd love to hook you up. Uh, one of those things is actually a Luke uh, journal where you can take notes during our series through Luke that we're in right now. Also, uh, we got a mother baby room. For those of you, here's what I've, here's what I've noticed in 12 years of, of, of being a lead pastor here is that sometimes babies don't like my preaching and I try not to take it personal, but sometimes they just, they just say, I don't like this guy, right? So if you, need, if you need a room, if you'd like a room, we have a room for you where the, the sermon's being streamed in. We've got soft lighting in there, real comfortable chairs and just a room for our uh, mothers and babies and also an incredible kids ministry. Uh, if you're looking for a place for your kids to learn God's word, learn the gospel, just in case you are new here, man, we got an awesome kids ministry that's gospel-centered, Bible-focused here, and we'd love uh, to, to engage your kids in that all ages up through fifth grade. And so I also want to say this, and this is really important, and it's good that you're here so you can write this down. Um, on October the 23rd, okay, that's two Sundays from now, October 23rd, we have a very important announcement uh, for the church family, for the Emmaus Church family for you to know about, be aware of, for the future of our church. And so go ahead and mark your calendars and don't say, well, I didn't know about, yes, you did, okay? And so mark your calendars, October 23rd, that Sunday is gonna be a significant Sunday where we're able to kind of, kind of bring you up to speed, family, on, on some, some, some directions the Lord is, is leading us as a church. So that being said, Luke chapter one is where we're at, okay? We're, we're in a series, we're five weeks into a series through the gospel of Luke, and we're still in chapter one. So you do the math there. We're gonna be here for a minute, but uh, what are we gonna do? We're gonna trust God's word and just walk through the scriptures. And uh, I'm gonna pray for us real quick, and then we'll, we'll dive in, uh, beloved. Jesus, thank you so much for uh, a new day. Thank you that when that sun came up this morning, Lord, your mercies were new. And I don't know, if, I don't know how much of the family saw it this morning, but that moon going down today was unbelievable. And the heavens declare the glories of God and the skies proclaim the work of your hands. And so, Lord, we pause right now to say thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Lord's day. We're able to gather together to worship, to make much of Jesus. And, uh, Lord, I'm just so grateful. Grateful for the opportunity to be here today and to breathe air and to have my heart beating in my chest and have an opportunity for us to just look to Jesus and worship Jesus and think on Jesus and be hopefully transformed by your Holy Spirit. So thank you for the gospel of Luke. Would you have your way in our lives? And I pray it all through your matchless name, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so here's the deal. Two, two Saturdays ago, two Saturdays ago, I had the opportunity to take my youngest daughter, Madeline, to see the greatest football team on earth. And I don't have to tell you who that is. If you know, you know. Go dogs. And so there we were. We, we finished the game. We, my, my youngest daughter and I, we go to the bookstore, the UGA bookstore, with 90,000 other fans just to sort of look around and browse and we walk in the door, and as soon as we walk in, we immediately see over in the corner, there's all, these, there's all these television cameras, like professional television cameras all set up, and there's these lights, and there's a guy holding a microphone, and, and he's standing there, and he's speaking into the camera, and, and we're sitting there looking at it for a second. It turns out they were doing a, a TV show, a live-streamed television show, post-game show, interviewing fans getting the fans' perspectives on the game and on what happened and what they thought and how the team played. And, and we're watching this for a minute. And my youngest daughter, Madeline, looks at me. She goes, Dad, you should do an interview. <laughs> and I thought about it for a second. I looked at her. I said, sweetheart, you're totally right. <laughs> because I'm the number one UGA fan in the world, and I have unmatched analysis I could give for this team, and, and, and I, I have so much value to add to this live stream. You can see I was feeling very humble on this day, right? And, and, and so I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. She goes, really? I said, yeah, I'm gonna do it. And so I go and I get in line. They had a line for the interviewees, right? And I'm in line, and the entire time I'm in line, I'm, I'm rehearsing in my mind what I'm gonna say. What am I gonna say? Let me, let me get a speech together real quick. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna analyze the offense, I'm gonna analyze the defense, I'm gonna analyze the special teams. It's gonna be brilliant. It's gonna be unbelievable. Matter of fact, it might get picked up by ESPN. They might put it on Sports Center that night. Seriously. I might have Coach Kirby Smart himself call me on Monday going, Anson, you don't know me, but I saw your interview and we need you. Come here, right? 
I mean, I'm thinking this is going to be amazing. This is going to be unbelievable. This is going to go viral. It's going to go viral. People all over the world are going to watch this interview, right? I'm going to have folks in Uganda going, man, he knows football, right? I'm just thinking this is going to be awesome. And so I get, finally it's my turn. The host looks at me, motions for me to come over. I walk over to him. He says, sir, please give me your name and tell me your thoughts. I looked in the camera. I said, my name is Anson McMahon, and here are my thoughts. And I went off. I'm talking like the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, family. I'm just letting it rip. I'm just going. I'm analyzing this and that and the other. And finally, after two minutes of just going off, I, two full minutes, I look in the camera and I said this. I said, go dogs. And I walked away. And I walked right into the producer who looked at me and said, sir, thank you so much for giving us that interview. Unfortunately, as soon as you started speaking, our internet froze up. So we heard nothing, but thank you. And so it turns out, as soon as it was my turn, the internet malfunctions, which means for two minutes, nobody heard a single word that I had to say, but instead the picture froze up, and for two minutes, all that was seen was, we got the picture, that's it. <laughs> two minutes. It's the, it's the only thing. I love it. I look like some creeper weirdo stalker that snuck into the picture. Two minutes. <laughs> so this is over. This is over. My, my daughter and I watch this on my phone. And she looked at me and she goes, Daddy, how cringy do you feel right now? I said, baby, I feel very cringy. Thank you. Very, very cringy. Now, so here's why I take that off. Here, here's, why, here's why I tell you that story, family. So on that day, I, I obviously did not get what I was expecting, right? I didn't get what I was expecting because here's the deal. What I was expecting was this interview is going to go viral and the whole world is going to know about how much I know about football. Instead, what I got was two minutes of looking like a creepy weirdo, right? I totally didn't get what I was expecting. Now... Now, just so you know, this, this is exactly what brings us to Luke chapter 1, because here's what's going down. Here's what you need to see. So in this chapter, we have this married couple who we've been following now for a couple weeks. We have this married couple who is clearly not getting what they expected to get out of life. They're not getting what they expected. What I mean by that is this. So a couple weeks ago, we were introduced to an old married couple, right, named Zechariah and Elizabeth. They've been married for a long, long time, a ministry couple. He's a priest. She grew up as a pastor's daughter. They're married. They've been doing ministry together for years and years and years. They're elderly. They've never been able to have a baby of their own. They've dealt with infertility for their entire lives and then finally, one day, miraculously, God sends the angel Gabriel to, to have an encounter with our boy Zechariah. And, and he says to Zechariah, he says, hey, I got news for you. The Lord has heard your prayer, and the Lord's going to give you a son. You and Elizabeth are going to have a baby, and that baby is going to be a great prophet who's going to prepare the way for the Savior of the world, right? This is the angel's news to Zechariah, but Zechariah, you know, he's, he's flabbergasted. He can't even believe it, man. He's lived his whole life dealing with infertility. He knows they're past childbearing ages, so he doesn't believe it. He refuses to believe the promise of God, and so as a result, he's struck mute by the Lord. He's struck mute by the angel for nine months. He can't speak, and that brings us to verse 57, because when we come to verse 57, so nine months have now passed, Right? And this special baby is about to be born. And this is where we pick up this story, beloved, in, in verse 57. Check this out. It says this. Now, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they were all incredibly jealous and defriended her on Facebook because why didn't God do that for them? That's not what it says, right? And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. I want you to think about this. 
This actually brings us to our first point for today, which I think is significant before we go any further, family, and it's this. Number one, if you're, jotting, if you're taking copious notes, write this down. A true friend rejoices when God does a good thing in your life. I feel like this is worth hanging out on for us to consider this for a second, family. See, family, right out of the gate, what we're seeing is this. Elizabeth has some really great friends. But she totally, she totally does. She has some awesome friends because they're the kind of friends who rejoice and celebrate and are happy for you when God does a good thing in, in your life. They're the kind of friends who can rejoice for a friend. Notice what happens. This incredible event happens in Elizabeth's life. And what, what happens? They don't get resentful. They don't get upset. They're not bitter. They're not jealous. And they don't covet. But instead, what's going on? They're genuinely happy for their friend. They rejoice with their friend because they love their friend. And so they see something awesome happen in their friend's life and they're happy and let's celebrate and let's throw a party. And I wonder, family, do you, do you have any friends like that? Do you have any friends like that? Or, or let me ask this question. Are you, are you a friend like that? I, I love what the really solid old dead theologian J.C. Ryle says in his commentary on Luke about this text. I want to read this to you, family. J.C. Ryle in his commentary through Luke said this. I read this this week and I thought it was so rich. He said, we'll put it on the Jumatron for He said, how much, how much more happiness there would be in this evil world if conduct like that of Elizabeth's relations was more common Sympathy in one another's joys and sorrows costs little, and yet it is a grace of most mighty power. Like the oil on the wheels of some large engine, it may seem a trifling and unimportant thing, yet in reality it has an immense influence on the comfort and well-working of the whole machine of society. A kind word of congratulation or consolation is seldom forgotten. The heart that is warmed by good tidings or chilled by affliction is peculiarly susceptible and sympathy to such a heart is often more precious than gold. In other words, man, a word of congratulation, like when a friend is genuinely happy for you, that, that's significant, man. When you have friends that can celebrate with you, to, friends who can rejoice with those who rejoice. Sounds like a verse, Right? Rejoice with those who rejoice. But let's be honest, family. We live in a world, I don't, listen, we live in a world where we are constantly tempted pretty much on a daily basis to, to do this. We, we compare what another person is experiencing to what we ourselves are experiencing. Or, or we, look at, we, we look at the awesome, the, the awesome circumstances of someone else's life, right? And then we compare them to, to our circumstances, which are kind of a bummer right now and sort of unfortunate right now. We, we, we take someone else's circumstances, we, we're tempted to compare them to our circumstances, and we're tempted to become very, very jealous. Get a little resentful, right? Start to covet a little bit because someone else's situation isn't like my situation, so I start to get jealous. And if you ever notice, we even do this about dumb stuff, Right? This is we like this, this weird thing that happens in the human heart because we're fallen, man, and we deal with sin and we wrestle with it all the time. We, we even get jealous about weird, goofy stuff, right? I mean, this, this happened to us recently in our home. So, I, uh, so my youngest daughter was playing Mario Kart. Anybody playing Mario Kart in here, right? And so the only thing, the, 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 only, the next best thing to playing Mario Kart is watching it, right? And so I'm just sitting there being entertained by my daughter playing Mario Kart in, in, the, in the living room. And so I'm watching her play Mario Kart, and then all of a sudden my wife walks into the room. And my daughter looks at my wife, and then she looks at me, and she gets the idea, light bulb goes off. She goes, hey, I got an idea. Mom, Dad, y'all should go against each other in Mario Kart. And Heather's like, no, I never play Mario Kart. I don't even know how that game works. I never play. And I'm looking at her going, come on, Heather, it'll be fun. It's just a game. It's just a game. Now, what I'm thinking is, I'm going to crush you right now. Because I have way more hours logged for Mario Kart than you do. You never touch the thing. And so I am going to, it's going to be incredible what happens right now. And so I'm like, no, let's do it, baby. It's just a game. Let's do it for the kids. It's just a game. She's finally like, okay, okay, yeah, that's fine. So she grabs a controller. I grab a controller, right? You see where this is going? We're playing Mario Kart. For the first two laps, I'm destroying her. The final lap, man, she somehow got one of those red turtle shell things. You know what I'm talking about? She shoots that thing at me, this heat-seeking missile. Boom, spins me out. She wins. Never played before. She wins. 
And she's over there going, I can't believe I won. That's so crazy. I've never even played before. This is crazy. This is crazy. No, I know in my mind what I ought to do. <laughs> I ought to look at my wife and say, good job, darling. That's amazing. Because it's just a game. That's what I ought to do. You want to know what I actually did? She's going, I can't believe I won. That's so crazy. I can't, I never played before. I can't believe I won. I looked at her and said, how's it feel to get lucky? Drop the control, walk out the room. (laughs) This is my depravity on display, right? But this is that weird thing we battle, right? We get jealous, we get envious, we get covetous over over the craziest stuff. And I think it's significant to look at this amazing moment that's just happened in Elizabeth's life, and yet she has friends around her who genuinely rejoice over what God's done in her life. I mean, I mean, just so you know, family, here, here's the deal. Here's why this matters, okay? So here's, here's why jealousy is so incredibly dangerous to your soul and to my soul. First of all, it's, it's dangerous. Jealousy is dangerous because just, just here, where it, it breaks one of the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, that's a bummer, right? Literally one of the big ten is, is this right here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, God's given his 10 commandments. He's given his law to Moses. And in 2017, he says uh, in Exodus, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's or how he does on Mario Kart, right? You shouldn't, covet, you shouldn't, look, at, you shouldn't look at something that someone else has and, and, and think to yourself, that should be mine instead of theirs. So the first reason it's dangerous, jealousy and envy is dangerous to the soul is because it breaks one of the big ten. But additionally, another reason why jealousy is so dangerous is, get this, family, whenever I'm jealous of you, right? So whenever I look at a circumstance happening in your life and I get envious and covetous and jealous because I'm like, I I wish that that should be happening in my life. Why Why does that get to happen to them? And I can't rejoice with you, but instead I get jealous. Whenever that's happening, it's always a clear indication that at that moment, I'm believing three specific lies, At the moment I'm jealous of you, I'm believing three specific lies. Lie number one says, if you have something, I should have it too. Lie number two says, if God really loves me, he'll give me everything I want. And lie number three says, my happiness, satisfaction, peace, and security depends on all my desires being fulfilled. But the problem is, those are three big fat lies. They're totally lies. See, family, the truth is this. Number one, I need nothing other than what I've already been given in Christ. Anything else is just gravy on the top, man. All I need is what I've been given through Christ. Number two, guess what? God does love me, and that has nothing to do with my circumstances. Has nothing to do with what God's doing in your life and not doing in my life. Nothing at all to do. God does love me. And he demonstrated it when Jesus was on a cross. And number three, family, my happiness and satisfaction and peace and security only depends on my hope in Jesus. That's it. Now follow this. When I remember those things... When I'm anchored in that stuff, y'all, then I too will be able to be a good friend to you who can genuinely rejoice when you rejoice. Because I know that God's sovereign and he determines what he divvies out and what he doesn't. And God's good. So Elizabeth's got some good friends who genuinely rejoice over this amazing thing that's happened. She got, she, she got a baby in her old age. Look at how faithful God's been. It's amazing. Now, look at verse 59. Watch what happens, family. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. Why? Because they love God and they're being good, faithful Jews. They're doing what God has told them to do in the Old Testament. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And what's this? And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. How many of you, you you had a baby, you're expecting a baby, and immediately you found out every stinking person in the world has got an opinion about what you should name that baby? How annoying is this, right? I remember remember, remember, uh, back years ago when we were expecting our very first daughter, we were living out in California, and we'd have people walking up to, so what you going to name it? 
What you going to name it? What you going to name it? It's like, well, we haven't decided yet. Well, I got a great name. I'm like, I don't care. Go have your own child and name it your weird name. I didn't ask for requests here. I don't, I don't care. And everybody's like, well, I got, I got a suggestion. I got, I got this name book, and look what I found. Right? Myrtle. Call her Myrtle, right? He said, we, everybody's got an opinion. Right? I remember one, I remember one and some people let their opinions known. They make them known, right? This one person comes up to me, so what are you going to name her? I'm like, well, we're, we're thinking about Annabelle Grace. Well, I don't like that. I'm like, well, I don't like you, so we're even. Okay, good. What, what, what are you talking about? Everybody's got an opinion. And it's so fascinating because this, this is even what's going on here, right? So, so they're like, what are you going to name the baby? You got a baby. Woo, yay. What are you going to name the baby? Elizabeth's like, John. And they're like, whoa. Well, according to custom, you should name him after somebody in the family. And there's nobody in your family named John. Name him after the daddy, right? And so they're like, they're, they're really confused by this. And I love this, verse 62. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted them to be called. So they're thinking to themselves, well, maybe Elizabeth's just gone rogue here. Let's go ask the daddy. Let's go see what the daddy wants to name him, right? And watch this. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. Now, I love that. I love the fact he doesn't say his name will be John or we'll name him John. Notice what he says. His name is John. Why? Because the angel, when it showed up earlier in Luke chapter 1, already told them, you're going to have a baby, name him John, a name that means God will be gracious. So the angel, listen, God's already named the baby. So I love Zechariah's like, listen, I'm not naming him. I'm telling you what his name is. He's already got a name. Like God already named this baby before he's even born. His name is John. And they, look at verse 6, 3. And they all wondered. They all wondered. Why are they, why are they wondering? Why are they in awe? Well, because for the first time in the history of the world, a husband and wife agree. I'm kidding. I'm playing. I'm playing. They're, they're, they're wondering because, what, this is weird. This isn't the way it works. You're supposed to name the baby after somebody in the family. What's going on here? This is different, right? And watch this. And immediately, his mouth, Zechariah's mouth was opened and his tongue loosed. And he spoke, cursing God because God had struck him mute for nine months. And that was really mean. And then he deconstructed his faith and became an atheist. Not what it says. See, see family, why, why, look at what it says. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke doing what? What's it say? <laughs> Blessing God. Blessing God. See, family, this brings us to the second point for today, which is this. Number two, jot this down. I could respond to affliction in my life by either running away from God or running to God. See, whenever we experience affliction, hard times, a valley, seasons of doubt, seasons of confusion, seasons that are incredibly inconvenient at best, we all, we all have a direction that we run. We tend to either run towards the Lord, I'm going to seek him, I'm going to pursue him, I'm going to be in his word, I'm going to be in the church, I'm going to gather together, I'm going to be in community, I'm, I, I, need, I need to be close to the Lord. Or what happens to a lot of us, man, is we dip and we run, the up, we run the opposite way, right? We run away from God, we avoid God, we get bitter towards God because if God really loved us, then why are we walking through this affliction? But here's what's so incredible about all this, family. Watch this, the very first thing our boy Zechariah does right here, as soon as he can speak again, after nine months of being silent, after nine months as a priest, not being able to preach, not being able to do what he typically did, not being able to have a conversation with his wife, after nine months of that family, the very first thing Zechariah does is he sings a song of worship. He blesses God with his lips. Why? Well, because for the past nine months as he's been mute, he hadn't been running away from the Lord. He hadn't been getting bitter at the Lord. But instead, he's been trusting God and worshiping God. And he's actually been growing in his relationship with God in the midst of affliction. For Zechariah, this, this season of, of, of pain and inconvenience and doubt and confusion has not been an excuse to run away from God. It's been reason to run to him. And I wonder, beloved, Whenever you walk through a season of affliction, because we all do, amen? We all walk through the fire. We all walk through seasons of confusion and doubt. Whenever you walk through a season of affliction, do you run from God? 
Or instead, do you run to the Lord? Do you run to his word? Do you run to his church? Do you run to obedience? Do you run to group? Do you, do you run to him? Or another way to ask it would be this. So are you a person who actually believes the words of the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 71? I love this. Psalm 119, 71, the psalmist says, watch this. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Wow, dude. Can you imagine? See, we, we instinctively, we're like, no, it's, affliction's bad. It's bad for me to walk through affliction. It's bad for me to walk through pain. It's bad for me to walk through trials. The psalmist goes, it was good for me to walk through affliction insofar that I was able to learn your statutes, meaning I, I, the season of affliction has been an opportunity to scoot up real close to my heavenly father and get to know his heart more. Do you run towards him or away from him in affliction? Now watch what happens in verse 65, family. This is incredible. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, watch this, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was on him. And this is the family. This brings us to our third point for today, which is this. Number three, jot this down. Number three, when God's hand is on a life, it always causes that life to look different. Don't miss the significance of this, man. When God's hand is on a life, it always causes that life to look different. So pay close attention to what these verses are, are indicating for us. The people here, like Elizabeth's friends and relatives, they, they, they are acknowledging right here that it is clear to them through these circumstances, that God totally has his hand on the life of this baby, right? I mean, here they are. This baby's born to this old couple who was never supposed to have children. And then all of a the sudden, they name him John, which goes against all the societal, societal norms. And then all of a sudden, once, once Zechariah is able to declare that on a writing tablet, he's able to speak and he starts praising God. And so through all this, it's clear to them. And God obviously has his hand on this child. Who's this child going to grow up to be? What's going on here? They knew that God had his hand on this baby. John, and by the way, family, listen, we're standing on this side of all these events, and so we totally know that this is true because of what the rest of the Bible teaches us about this dude, John the Baptist, right? And so we, we have the luxury of standing here and gazing back and going, well, yeah, God completely has his hand on this baby, and we know that for a few reasons. First of all, if you remember back in Luke chapter 1, verse 15, when the angel first announced to Zechariah, you're going to have a baby, you're going to have a baby. In Luke chapter 1, verse 15, here's what the angel Gabriel said about that baby. He said, for he will be great before the Lord. He's going to be great. Now, now notice what it said. It didn't say he's going to be great before the world. It didn't say he's going to be great in the eyes of the world. He's going to be great in the eyes of God. Now, how many of y'all know there's a difference Huge difference between being great in the eyes of the world and the culture and being great in the eyes of God. Now, what's fascinating is later on in Luke chapter 7, when we get there in, in a few years or months or however long it's going to be, we're going to have Jesus speaking to his disciples. And in a conversation with his disciples, Jesus lets us in on an incredibly significant truth about John the Baptist when in Luke chapter 7, verse 28, Jesus is going to say this. He says, I tell you, think about this, I tell you, among those born of women, none None is greater than John. So what do we have here? We, we, have, we, have, the, we have God the Father announcing through the, through the angel Gabriel that he's going to be great. We have God the Son, Jesus Christ, announcing there's been none greater born of women than John the Baptist. And so, so this idea that he's great in the eyes of God, it's different from being great in the eyes of the culture. He's great in the eyes of the Lord because his hand, God's hand is on him. That's why, because God's hand is on him. So the question now becomes this. What does it actually look like for God to have his hand on your life. Because there's a ton of confusion about this, man. Like even in church circles and Christian circles, there's massive confusion about this, this idea of what does it mean to, to have the Lord's, you know, some would use the, the phraseology to have the Lord's anointing on your life or God's hand on your life or the Lord, the Lord, the Lord just shining his face upon you as it says in the book of Numbers. What does it look like for God to have his hand on your life? Like tangibly, 
What are the practical things does that look like? Does it, look, does it mean you'll be rich and attractive and powerful and you'll wear nice clothes and you'll live in a mansion over in John's Creek and have an air-conditioned doghouse for your puppy? Is that what it means to have God's hand upon your life? Well, guess what? Not for John. That is not at all what it meant for, for John. See, John, we're told explicitly in the scriptures, he's got the hand of God on his life. But here's what we know. So follow this. Here's what we know about what John's life is going to be like when he grows up. You ready? First of all, first of all, the Bible tells us that much like the prophet Elijah in the Old Testament, you could you do a character study of Elijah. You'll find this about, out about him. Elijah or John the Baptist actually wore the same clothes that the prophet Elijah wore, meaning John the Baptist walked around in camel's hair. So not exactly trying to make an impressive fashion statement. Amen. Additionally, we're told that he ate locusts and grasshoppers for dinner. Every now and then he'd visit the occasional beehive for dessert, right? So not what you would call a foodie. What else do we know about him? He lives out in the desert. Lives out in the wilderness, in the middle of the desert by himself, probably to avoid HOAs, amen? We got, <laughs> just saying. He spends his entire ministry calling for greedy people and Roman soldiers and tax collectors to repent of their sin because God's mad at them. Not exactly a popular message. And to top it all off, you know what's so significant to me about John the Baptist is his humility. You know what happens? Eventually, when Jesus finally shows up in humility, you know what John the Baptist is going to do? He gives all of his followers to Jesus. Think about that. Dude has this massive following because God's hand is on his life. And then as soon as Jesus comes up on the scene, you know what John does? John, John says to all his followers, go to him, follow him. You're done with me. He's the one. I must become less. He must become greater, right? Which is a lot like a pastor saying to the people in his church, hey, don't come here anymore. Go to that church over there. It's way better church. You talk about Humility. In other words, family, here's, what we know. here's the bottom line. Here's what we totally know to be true about John. He didn't look like the culture. He didn't talk like the culture. And he didn't live like the culture. Why? Because God's hand was on his life. Family, think about this. Listen, there's a really powerful principle right here, and it's this. When God's hand is on your life, one of the things that's going to be clear is this. Your life is going to look completely different than the culture around you. Can I tell you something, beloved? Listen, listen to me, listen. This world does not need more people who look like the world. This world doesn't need more churches that look like the culture. You know what this world needs? This world needs a church that looks different from the culture. Why? Because God's hand is on her. Do you live different? Do you look different? Do you talk different by the power of the Holy Spirit? Because God's hand is on you. Now watch what happens in verse 67, family. Check this out. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, now, now just pause right there for a second. I don't know if you noticed this, so you've been here all five weeks. You notice how often, even over the past five weeks, all through chapter one, we've just seen Luke say, filled with the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. This is one of the reasons why historically a lot of scholars have referred to the gospel of Luke as the gospel of the Holy Spirit. Because over and over and over again, you see, you see the Holy Spirit showing up in this gospel. And his, and his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, and by the way, can I also point this out? Can I also point out the fact that whenever we're told that somebody was filled with the Holy Spirit, typically what happens immediately is that they begin to say awesome things about Jesus. Some people go, well, you know, the sign that you're filled with the Holy Spirit is you start to speak in a tongue and speak in different language. No, that's a spiritual gift, and Paul talks about in Corinthians. You know what the sign that you're filled with the Holy Spirit actually is? The main sign is that you start talking about how awesome Jesus is. 
That's the clear sign that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's the clear sign that a church has the Holy Spirit. And that's the clear sign that a follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit. Is do you say amazing things about Jesus? Do you appoint to Jesus? Do you exalt Jesus? Do you sing to Jesus? Do you preach about Jesus? Do you lift up high Jesus? Because we're told in the scriptures that no one can say Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. It's about declaring the goodness of Jesus. And so Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit and immediately begins to say awesome things about Jesus. He prophesied saying, look at this, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Watch this. That we should be saved from our what, family? enemies and from the hand of all who, what's that word? Hate us. And we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Here's Zechariah and he's declaring how good it is that Jesus is coming, that a savior is on the way, that John's been born to prepare the way for this savior. But notice he's not saying awesome things about his son that's just been born. He's saying awesome things about Jesus because he knows John's been born because he's gonna prepare the way for Jesus. And one of the things he tells us about Jesus, the coming savior, is that Jesus Christ is coming to defeat the enemy and to save us from all who hate us, which actually brings us to the fourth point for today, which is his family. Listen, number four, Jesus has come into this world to save me from those who hate me. To save me from those who hate me. See, beloved, don't make the mistake of, of believing that all Zechariah is talking about here when he refers to enemies who hate them is just evil empires like Rome. That's where our minds can immediately go to. Well, he's referring to the Romans and they're in town and he thinks the Messiah is going to come in, kick every buddy out. Listen, that is not all that's going on here. There's something much deeper and much more spiritually significant happening here. There's a, there's a South African uh, Bible scholar uh, named Norville Gildenheis. I read every now and then, and, and I love what, what he says about this, this moment right here. Watch this. He says, although there may be a reference here to political liberation as well, something far more glorious is meant. The wholehearted service of the Lord in complete freedom from all bonds of sin, guilt, punishment, curse, Satan, and destruction. Now watch this, family. This is really important. Listen, here's what our boy Zechariah totally knows. There is no one that hates you more than the devil does. Nobody. There's no one who hates you with this severe malice more, more than Satan does. So, so here's, the, here's the mistake that sometimes we make. And, w- and when I say we, I mean those of us who, I know not everybody in here is necessarily a Christian, not everybody here necessarily is trusted in Jesus as their Savior, but many of us have. And what a lot of us as Christians, those of us who have been saved by grace, the, the mistake that a lot of us make is this. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about and having conversations about, you know, God's will for my life, right? We want to know what's God's will for my life and, and God's purpose for my life. And, and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But, but the problem is we spend a ton of time talking about God's will for our lives and we rarely, if ever, talk about Satan's will for our lives, but how many of you in here understand that Satan also has a will for your life, right? So, so the reality is, yes, of course God has a will and purpose for our lives, and we read about it in the scriptures, the text, he's given us the word. But the devil also has a will and a purpose for our lives, and we don't talk about that a lot. And some of us wrongly assume this. So some of us are thinking, well, of course, man, I know that the devil has a will for my life, and I know what the devil's will for my life is. The devil wants me to not believe in God and to be an atheist, to which I go, no, 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 you're, you're wrong, you're, wrong. You're, you're mistaken. Family, can I tell you something? The devil's just fine with you believing in God as long as you don't worship him. I mean, the demons believe in God, we're told, and they tremble. The demons know that God is God. The demons aren't atheists. The demons know that Jesus is the Son of God. The enemy is just fine with you believing in God. He's just fine with you reading a bunch of books about God. He's just fine with you having conversations about God. He's just fine with you posting verses about God on the socials. He's just fine with all that. He just doesn't want you to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. In fact, beloved, Satan wants you, listen, can I tell you something? Listen, Satan wants you to love anything more than you love God. A lot of us assume that always means, well, a bad thing, an evil thing. Well, no, sometimes you, listen, 
You can, love a, you can love a good thing too much. See, the problem is often, and that's typically what we do, especially in a society like ours where we're all trying to be good citizens and good people, is what we, what we tend to do is in our context is we turn good things into God things, and that's when they become bad things. The moment we love anything in this world more than we love God, it becomes a bad thing. Because we have then usurped the place of God in our lives. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants you to love anything more than you love God. It doesn't really matter what it is. Good thing, bad thing. It could be money. It could be sex. It could be power. It could be your truth. It could be Xbox 360, popularity with people, food, your body, your political ideology. It could be social justice, your kids, travel baseball. It really doesn't matter what it is as long as there's something else that you love more than you love God because here's what the enemy knows. You'll never, ever find true peace and satisfaction anywhere other than in God. And so it doesn't matter what it is. Love anything more than you love God. That's the enemy's will for your life. And just like Romans chapter one says, family, because we're all born into this broken world as sinners, we are all prone to what? To look for our satisfaction in created things other than God. That's what Romans one says. It's our default setting as sinners, man. We're all prone to look. I'm gonna find my satisfaction and my peace in, in created stuff. But I got good news for your family. I got good news for you. Anybody want some good news? Anybody? Here's the good news. The good news is this. Jesus came to save you from the one who hates you. Like Satan has a will and an agenda for your life. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants you dead. He wants you destroyed. One of the clearest examples we have of what Satan wants in your life, by the way, is when we read the story of the the demon-possessed man in in Mark chapter 5 that Jesus meets at the tombs. Anybody remember this story? Right? Remember the whole, my name is Legion, for we are many weird thing? Right? Remember what he's doing? Remember Remember what this guy's doing when Jesus finds him? Right? He's been chained up in tombs by the people in the village because that's typically how the world likes to treat people who have spiritual problems. Just get rid of them and, you know, it'll be fine. And he's chained up in the tombs. And what's he doing? All day and night long, he cuts himself with stones. What a clear picture of what the enemy wants. He wants you to hate yourself. He wants you to destroy yourself. He wants to destroy your life, wreck your life. He wants you dead. But then Jesus comes and he saves us from the one who hates us. Born to a virgin, he lived the perfect life that you would never live. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And on that day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, guess what? The enemy was defeated forever. Forever. And so we're living in this magnificent period of time, the already not yet, where the enemy's been defeated, but we're still waiting for that moment where he's going to have that really bad day that we read about at the end of the book of Revelation where Jesus tosses them into a lake of fire, right? But right now he's still trying to do everything he can to attack believers and attack the church and attack the world and attack the culture and all those things, right? But there is a sense of peace we can have and confidence we can have as Christians, followers of Jesus, who guess what? We've read the end of the book. We know how the thing ends. Our team wins. Team Jesus wins. Last Saturday, I'm at home, man. I'm at home, and I'm sitting there watching the Georgia Bulldogs play Missouri. And I'm all night long, man. I'm sitting, and I don't like games like that because they're at night, and I got to preach the next day, and I'm stressed out of my mind at 11 o'clock at night, not knowing how this thing's going to end. But if I would have known how that game was going to end, I'd have never stressed. I'd just be eating my pizza rolls, right? Defeating my wife at Mario Kart. Wouldn't even be watching the game, right? There's a sense of peace we can have as followers of Jesus knowing that Jesus came to defeat the enemy, to save us from the one who hates us. And by the way, this is why we gather and this is why we worship and this is why we sing and this is why we have a good time. This is why we serve one another and we, we give and we, we serve and we do all these great things. Why? Because we know that Jesus Christ has freed us from the one who hates us. What an incredible thing to be a blood-bought, saved Christian redeemed from the enemy by our champion, Jesus Christ. And then look at verse 72. Watch what it says, family. He's talking about Jesus. He said, Jesus came to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear. Do you see that? That we might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. This brings to the fifth point for today, which is this, family number five, jot this down. The right response to the grace of Jesus is to serve him. 
The right response to the grace of Jesus, to experiencing what it means to be saved by Christ, is to serve King Jesus. Don't miss his family. According to our boy Zechariah right here, there's a very specific response that, that we're supposed to have to the grace of Christ, once we taste and see that he's good, once we trust in him as Savior, there's a response we're supposed to have to the incredible reality that Jesus has rescued us from the enemy and from hell and from sin and from wrath and from all the things, right? And that response, the peculiar particular response that Christians are supposed to have to the grace of Jesus is this. We're supposed to serve King Jesus for the rest of our lives. Like the rest of my life is, is Jesus's. It's, it's about serving Jesus and walking with Jesus and being faithful to Jesus. I want to serve him, which means, family, listen, the right response, the right response to the grace of Jesus is to not just, it's not just to sit on my comfortable couch in my living room, eating Doritos, reading the Left Behind series, waiting for the day I die to go see Jesus. That ain't it. As heavenly as that sounds sometimes, that's not it. The right response to the grace of Jesus is to serve him. To serve Jesus through worship. To serve Jesus through using our spiritual gifts within God's family, God's, the household of God as Paul talks, talks about it, man. To, to, to serve Jesus through evangelism and talking to people around us about the grace of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the reality of Jesus. I wonder, beloved, how are you serving Jesus as an act of worship? Notice what Zechariah says. He's come to defeat the enemy, to defeat the one who hates us, that we might serve him without fear. Now watch verse 76. Watch what happens here, family. And I love this moment because, listen, here's what's going on. You got you to see this. You got to see this. So we have this moment. Zechariah has been blessing God and praising God and singing to God after being mute for nine months. And every indication from this verse now is that, I don't know if he was holding baby John, but at the very least he looks down at baby John because he begins to address baby John. And watch what he says to baby John here, family, in verse 76. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. And incidentally, family, this brings us to the sixth point, and it's worth talking about a little bit. And the sixth point is this, family, listen. A faithful life is not always an easy life. Faithful life isn't usually an easy life. So here, I'll be honest with you, man. I, I wonder, so here's what I wonder. He says, so he looks down at baby John, his little baby face, little chubby baby face, and he says, and you, child, will be called a prophet the prophet of the most high. And I almost wonder, get this man, I almost wonder if at that moment when those words are leaving Zechariah's mouth and he says, you will be called the prophet of the most high as he's looking at his baby. I almost wonder if as a father, he feels a little conflicted. Because as a good student of scripture, here's what Zechariah would have totally known. Prophets tend to be very lonely dudes who eventually get murdered. I mean, he would have totally known this as a, as a priest, as a student of the Old Testament. Just look at the Old Testament, man. Amos tortured, Micah killed, Isaiah sawn in half, Jeremiah stoned to death, and on and on and on it goes. See, beloved, here's how it works. When God, call, when God calls you to stand up in front of an entire nation and tell all the people that they're wicked and God's going to judge them with fire, that tends not to win you a lot of friends, amen? Not a very popular message that that, that whole judgment thing is, right? Matter of fact, the, you know what the Bible tells us? The Bible tells us that eventually, you know what God's going to call John to do? Eventually, the Lord is going to call John the Baptist to preach against King Herod. Think of that, man. This evil, maniacal king, God's going to call John to, to preach against Herod, the king of Israel, that he himself is a sinner and he needs to repent of his sin because he's going to face a judgment of God. If he doesn't repent of his sin, right? And you got it. Like I almost think if John was thinking, oh, wonderful. The Lord wants me to speak out and offend the, the, the most powerful evil man in Israel who owns a very sharp ax. This should go well. This should be fantastic. Awesome. This is what God calls him to do. But, but here's what we're seeing. 
Don't miss this. What is it that God, that God the Father and Jesus have already said John the Baptist is? Great, right? He's great. And he's a great man who the Lord intentionally calls to live a very difficult life. Greatness before God does not mean you get the easy life. Greatness before God meant that John lived a very difficult, hard life. And just so you know, family, listen, somewhere along the line, what every Christian has to decide is this. Do I want to live a faithful life or do I want to live an easy life? Do I want to live a faithful life or do I want to live an easy life? Because I'm just telling you, man, when you read the Bible, what you find out is that those two things are very different things. Incidentally, this is exactly why later on in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 10, verse 3, (laughs) this has always just been an interesting image to me. So Jesus is standing in front of his disciples. In Luke chapter 10, verse 3, here's what he says to his disciples. You ready for this? He says this. He says, go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Wouldn't that special? Isn't that what you want to hear, right? Anybody in here play, did you ever play high school football? Anybody in here play high school football? Me too. I was a starting running back, and I'm kidding. Look at me. No. If you played high school football, how'd you like for this to be the coach's pregame speech? Okay, guys, let's go get them. You're lambs, they're wolves. Woo! That's typically not going to go well for you. I don't know if you've ever seen Discovery Channel, but you rarely ever see lambs and wolves having tickle fights in the field, right? You, You don't see a lamb getting put in a cage with wolves and going, this is comfy. It's not typically how it works. It's bloody, it's hard, it's difficult, it's gory, and yet this is the image that Jesus gives to his faithful followers who are following him in this world. Hey guys, I'm, I'm sending you out and you're like lambs and, and the world, the culture is like wolves. The point is this, it's not easy to walk faithfully with Jesus in this world, but listen to me family, it's always worth it. It's always worth it. Now now watch verse 76. Check this out, family. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light, to give light. On the count of three, everybody say light. You ready? One, two, three. Light, he's going to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. On the count of three, I would say guide. You ready? One, two, three. Guide, he's going to guide. He brings light as a guide. And this brings us to our seventh point for today, family. We're almost done. Seventh point is this. Jesus Christ has come to be our guide, not our hobby. (laughs) Audience participation for a second, okay? You ready for this? I got a question for your family. What does a hacky sack, a jigsaw puzzle, putting together model cars and parasailing all have in common? They're all hobbies. They're all hobbies. How many of y'all got a hobby? Raise your hand. Anybody got a hobby? Most of y'all got a hobby, right? You got a hobby. You got, you, got, you got a hobby, some kind of thing you love doing in your spare time, like, you know, making candles or calligraphy or macrame or rock, rock collecting or geocaching or... Some of you stand in front of a crock pot and you make your own essential oils like a weirdo. Something, right, that keep you busy and you do your stuff and it's fun and you do it in your spare time. Got a little hobby, right? I mean, here's the deal. Most of us in here have some kind of hobby to keep us sane, those mental health breaks, right? We, things we enjoy doing in our spare time, right? And, and see, beloved, just, you know, like I looked, I looked up this past week in the dictionary, I looked up the word hobby. I want to know what the word hobby actually literally means. And the word hobby in the dictionary said this right here. A hobby is, you ready? A hobby is an activity you enjoy doing in your spare time. That's a hobby. It's this activity you enjoy doing in your, in your spare time. When you got time for it, you, you, you do this thing and you enjoy doing this thing when you have the time. And some people have weird hobbies, right? You ever notice this? I remember 12 years ago, we first planted Emmaus Church, man. I remember this guy was coming to our church, and uh, I, I remember he walks up to me it's, uh, after the service one Sunday. He's like, hey, Anson, next weekend, I don't know if you can go with us, man, but I wanted to invite you, man. Uh, you want to go with us spelunking? I said, do what? He said, do you want to, next weekend, we go, me and some buddies, every year we go up to East Tennessee, we go spelunking. I said, what is spelunking? 
He said, well, we, we, we go up to East Tennessee and there's, a, there's some caves and we crawl around in the caves and we explore the caves. You want to go, go spelunking? You want to go explore the caves with us? I said, no, I don't. I used to. Then I turned five. <laughs> I decided I want to be a dinosaur instead, okay? I, I don't know. I don't want to go spelunking with you, right? But some people, they, they got, this, this is what this guy did. He just, in his spare time, he just went spelunking and went crawling through caves, exploring like a redneck Indiana Jones. That was his thing. And he just loved doing it, a little lantern on his head. This is what hobbies are. It's something we enjoy doing. Sometimes it's a weird thing and we enjoy doing it in our spare time. Now, here's the problem. Here's what's dangerous. If we're not careful, we can get to a point in our lives where we start to treat Jesus like he's our hobby. Right? Start to have an attitude that goes like this. Well, I'll go to church when I can. I'll go to group when I can. I'll serve when I can. And I'll give to the work of the Lord when I can. And I'll tell friends about Jesus when I can. But you've got to understand, my life's really busy with a lot of important things. So I'll fit, G- I'll fit the king of the universe in when I can. I'll, I'll put him on the priority list right under macrame and jigsaw puzzles. I just pencil him in and I'll get to him when I can. But just so you know, family, the problem with treating Jesus as if he's just a hobby is this. A hobby is something that I fit in to my busy schedule. It's not something that commands my schedule. But what does Zechariah say about Jesus? Jesus has come to be your guide. He's coming to be our guide. He shines. We live in a dark world and we need light and the light comes from Christ and who Christ is and what Christ does and what Christ says, what Christ teaches and, and he's our guide. And what's, the, by definition, what do we give a guide? Leadership, right? By definition, a guide has authority. A guide is the one who's giving us information, who's telling us what we didn't know because the guide knows more than we know, right? And so Jesus Christ has come to be our guide and not our hobby. Jesus wants to command my schedule and not just fit into my already busy schedule. Does he command your schedule? Does he command your life? Is he your guide? That's who Christ has come to be. And then... then, that being said, we get, we get to the final verse. Look at the final verse. We're going to close things down. Watch, watch, how this, watch how this chapter ends. It's fascinating to me, man. Verse 80. And the child, we're talking about, talking about John, right? We're talking about John still. And the child grew and became an all-star on the Little League squad. And the child grew and became president of the beta club. Uh-uh. And the child grew, and he took tap dancing classes on Sunday, and that was drag because he missed church, but at least became a great tap dancer. That's not what it says, okay? And the child grew and became, watch this, strong in spirit. Do you know this is the only verse we have about the childhood of John the Baptist? It's it. This is the only verse we have about the childhood of John the Baptist. It says, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. And just so you know, this brings us to our final point for today, which is this. The spirit, listen, parents in the room, gather around. The spiritual development of your child matters more than anything else in your child's life. So a lot of you have kids. If you don't have kids, if you're too young to have kids, just take copious notes for the future and whatever God's got for you. For those of you who do have kids, particularly those of you with younger kids, maybe just lend me your ear for just a second. Again, what's so fascinating is this is literally the only verse in the entire Bible that tells us anything at all about the childhood of John the Baptist, who was called great in the eyes of God, who was called greater than anyone ever born of a woman by Jesus. And what does it say? He became strong in spirit. Strong in spirit, or to say it another way, this dude grew in godliness. So I got a question for all the, all the parents in the house real quickly. And the question is this. Is it, your, is it your top main priority as a parent who, by the way, only gets to do this thing once? <laughs> only gets to do this thing once. And by the way, okay, for, those of you with, for those of you in here with grown kids, um, how many of y'all know you blink your eyes and they grow up? Right? I, mean, I think I told you, I mean, our oldest daughter now is driving. She's driving herself to school. She's driving herself to church. And I still, it's weird, man, because she's sitting in the driver's seat and I still see a three-year-old driving away in a car, right? That's how I visualize you. You blink your eyes and 
They're growing. As, as a parent, here's the question. Is, is, is it your top priority as a parent who only gets to do this parenting thing once to do everything possible to make sure that before anything else in this world, you cultivate an environment where your child grows in godliness, grows in Christ. And some of us are thinking, well, of course that's what I want. Of course, yeah, I want my child to grow spiritually. So pray tell, how does that happen? Is there a good devotional book you can recommend? Or should my kids watch Veggie Tales till they're 18? Or should we be memorizing the book of Leviticus as a family? Like pray tell, pastor, what should we do? How can I make sure we cultivate an environment of spiritual growth in our family? Well, let me ask you a question. Did you know that according to statistics, man, and, and studies and surveys have been done and all this stuff, did you know that the most effective thing you can possibly do to cultivate an environment of spiritual growth intentionally within your home so that your children have an environment where they can be encouraged to grow spiritually, the most effective thing you can do according to statistics is, you ready for it? Go to church. This guy named Cameron Cole recently wrote an article on the Gospel Coalition called Parents Go to Church. Parents Just Go to Church. And here's what he said. I want to read this to you. This is fascinating to me. He says, when I was a kid, we went to church every single week, even on vacation. I often complained about it, though I liked the donuts they served at Sunday school. I asked my father, why can't we take a week off? My old school dad would always reply in the same gruff southern drawl, Son, God gives us seven days a week. We can sacrifice one morning for him. My family's commitment to Sunday worship communicated major truths to me. God is the center of life. God is worthy of praise and worship. The Christian life requires sacrifice and discipline. My father rarely talked to me about spiritual matters. I don't think he had a vast vocabulary for such conversations. Still, he modeled the Christian life well, largely through his unflinching commitment to go to church every Sunday. If you feel inadequate to lead your kids spiritually, just go to church. If strategizing about your Christian parenting feels overly complicated, just go to church. If you've been taking a few too many Sundays off, just go to church. If all this seems overwhelmingly difficult, ask God to give you the grace to have this consistent discipline in your family's life. Faithful church attendance can have an eternal influence on your kids. See, see family, here's, what's, here's why this is so important. We'll go parenting 101 here for just a moment as we close down. For the parents in the house, listen, every single thing you do in your home is training your children about what normal looks like. Like your home is like this incubator, right? It's like this incubator that you as a parent lead and, 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 and your prayers oversee and, and you're, you're, you, you set the spiritual temperature of that little incubator and, 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 and in this incubator, you're, you're, set, you're setting the trajectory of, of, of their lives. You're setting what their worldview is gonna be. You're, you're encouraging them to see, hey, here's what normal's gonna look like, right? When you go out there and experience something different, that's weird because here's what normal should actually look like in your life. And as a parent, I have to totally understand this, right? As a parent, of two girls like I, my wife and I have to understand, man, that with our two daughters, we're establishing what normal is going to look like to them for the rest of their lives. Like they start here and, and we're establishing in this incubator, is it gonna be normal? Are these things gonna be normal in their lives? Like, like is, it, is it gonna be normal to have dinner at the dinner table as a family every night together talking? Is that gonna be, is that gonna be normal? Is it going to be normal? Is it going to be normal to cheer for the Georgia Bulldogs every Saturday and do anything else is anathema, including if, especially if they wear orange, right? Are we going to? Is that going to be normal? Is it going to be normal for for us to eat lasagna every single Christmas Eve? Is that going to feel normal? And if we don't do that, it's going to feel off. Is it going to be normal for us to be worshiping Jesus together? On Sunday, what's normal look like? You know what scientists tell us, scientists and people with clipboards and pocket protectors and folks that are supposedly really smart at this stuff? You know, they say a child's brain is most receptive between the ages of two and seven. I'm talking mind like a steel trap, that age. It's like a sponge. 
say child, child's brain is, is most receptive between the ages of two and seven, which is why one of the things that we do here at Emmaus Church in our kids' ministry, man, when a child is between the ages of two and seven, is at some point, at some point, they are going to learn that song that a lot of us learned when we were kids that is so simple and yet powerful and can set the trajectory for their lives for years to come. We teach them that song with those lyrics that go like this. Remember this? Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. See, well, here's how this thing works. Listen, the more I focus on the love and the grace and the mercy of this Savior Jesus, just like Zechariah is doing right here in this text, the more I will grow in a relationship with Christ. And I'll be different, changed by his grace and his mercy and his love and his gospel. And so since this is true, before we pray, before we go to the communion tables, those of us in here who love Jesus or saved by the grace of Jesus, who name the name of Jesus and call ourselves Christians because we're saved by the mercy of God that Zechariah is talking about here in this song. Before, before we, before we do, do all of that and have a response time, we're, we're gonna do a little something like what Zechariah is doing right here. He's singing. We're gonna sing a song together right now, a cappella. And you better sing it with me and not make me feel dumb. <laughs> because I think it's significant. Did you, did you know here in the opening chapters of the, of the Gospel of Luke, there's four different songs? I hope you haven't missed that. We've already seen a few of them right here in chapter one. There's four different songs. You ever been to a musical? Been to a musical? Notice how when something significant happens in a musical, somebody always breaks out in a song. You know why they do that? Because it's, it's, it's a signal. Pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. This matters. This matters. This matters. This matters. This matters. This matters. And so we're going to end with a song. And you're going to sing it with me. And then we're going to pray. <clears throat> and I have no idea what the key is, so bear with me and show me some grace. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Second verse. Nobody knows it. <laughs> Nobody knows it. We got round cookies and juice in the lobby for you after this is over, family. That's it. Rest, rest in that today. Let's pray together, family. Oh, Lord Jesus, what a gift you are. Lord, it's amazing to me, the gospel of Luke, and we, we, we haven't even... <laughs> In this story, we haven't even seen you, Jesus, be born yet, and you're already changing the world, changing hearts, changing lives, causing people to sing, rejoice, because you've come to rescue us from the one who hates us. The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy, but you have come that we may have life and have it in abundance through you, Jesus, through the good news of the gospel. The reality is we're all sinners. We're all completely jacked. We've all messed up. We're all fallen. We all need grace and mercy. We all need light. We all need a guide in this dark world. And thank you that Zechariah sings a song to draw our attention to the truth that you are the guide. You are the light. 
You are mercy. You are love. You are the Savior who rescues us from the enemy who hates us. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray for anybody in here today who does not know you as their great God and Savior. They never turned from their sin and trusted in you alone, Jesus, as their Savior. That today you would convict them of sin, that they would know that they're a sinner, that they're not perfect. That they, as Jared talked about earlier, they, they can't do it. We can't do it. Only you are perfect, Lord. And thank you. You lived that perfect life. You died on the cross for us. You rose again from the grave, defeating death, hell, and the devil, that we might be saved. Pray if anybody today needs to trust in you as their Savior, Lord, that they would do so today, say yes to you. If anyone needs prayer today, pray that they would feel the freedom from your Holy Spirit to go to our prayer team at the back near the cross and just be prayed over and prayed for and prayed with. And I pray for those in here who do know you, Jesus. They love you and they worship you. The reality is, Lord, we live in a world where it just gets hard. And we're tempted so often to love created things more than we love you. And so I pray that, Holy Spirit, you convict us of that sin. And where we need to repent, would you grant us the gift of repentance? And I pray, Lord Jesus, as those of us who know you and love you and worship you, go to these tables, these communion tables around the room. And as we take the bread representing the body of Jesus that was nailed to the cross for us and we dip it in the cup representing your blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins, would we remember Jesus loves us. And I pray all of these things in the matchless name of King Jesus. Amen. mercy flow from up above that God would send his son to show his love that Christ in flesh would dwell to conquer hell and purchase worthless thieves and pardon you is this that took my place that Jesus Christ would die to show his grace that for the foes of God he bore the cross and withheld death from me the wage of sin Within the blood that 
death was crucified by God the Son, that in his sacrifice he poured out life, his wounds have now redeemed and wash the guilty clean what wonders what wondrous love is this that may Lord, we praise you for your mercy. Thank you for being our perfect Father. The Father of mercies, you called yourself. I pray that, that that truth would sink deep into our hearts, Lord, and that, Lord, out of your mercy, we would walk in obedience from this place in light of the, the word that, that was preached today. Lord, thank you for your grace, your mercy. We praise you for that. All glory be to you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, family, y'all can stay standing for just a quick moment. Um, just want to remind you of a couple things going on around our church. Um, pardon me so I can remind myself of them, so I can accurately remind you. <laughs> um, We've got a lot going on. Just uh, encourage you as we as we often do. Um, if you don't get our, our weekly emails where we send out announcements, um, just let us know somehow, some way. You can fill out one of the welcome cards and drop that in, just your email or something like that, and we can get those to you. But uh, especially if you're new to our church, we'd love to invite you to Growth Track. Um, this is our our membership class here 
at Emmaus where we'll, we'll talk about the, the history of our church and next steps for membership and how to, how to get more deeply involved here. Um, our next growth track class is on Sunday, November 13th. Um, so we'd love to invite you to that. You can sign up on our website. Um, feel free to snap the QR code that's right there as well if you'd like. Um, then a couple of other things that we've been announcing. Uh, we do have child dedication coming up on October 30th. Um, if that's something that you plan on participating in, please uh, fill out the, the information that's online again on our website uh, by this next Sunday. So this upcoming week will be the last week to sign up for that. Um, and praise the Lord, we have mission trips coming up this, this next summer. Um, by God's grace, we're going to be able to travel again, um, send a couple teams uh, both to Guatemala and Uganda uh, this upcoming summer, Lord willing. If you have any interest at all um, in, in participating in one of those trips, um, we've got a, an info meeting coming up, I believe, in about three weeks. Um, but all the information about all the trips, uh, the dates, the details, uh, what, what it takes to go, et cetera, is all on the website there that you'll see behind me. Uh, a couple final things. Uh, our men's prayer breakfast is coming up on the 22nd. So for all the men in the house, I'd love to invite you to that. Uh, just a morning for prayer um, on Saturday the, the, the 22nd. Um, we do just need to know that you're coming, obviously, to plan for food. Um, so feel free to sign up online for that. Last but not least, hope you've already signed up for this tour. Community night at the Buford Corn Maze is coming up uh, in just about a week and a half on the 19th. Um, it's going to be a ton of fun to have all of us. Um, we're a, you know, a two-service church right now, but it's a ton of fun to have basically the, the whole body all together. Um, and last but not least, family, as, as I'm sure you know, there's, there's no way that any, any of what happens here on a week-to-week -week basis or any of these, these awesome things that um, the Lord has, has enabled us to do, it, it comes through your generosity. Um, so we just want to say thank you for that, and, and uh, if the Lord would lay it on your heart to continue to give to our church, we have two ways to do that. Um, feel free to, uh, if you have cash or check, you can drop that at the, the box that you'll see on the way out. Um, you can also give online anytime, emmauschurch.com slash give. Feel free to let us know if you have any questions about that. Church family, we love you. Hope you have a fantastic rest of your Sunday. We'll see you soon.